This is the CraftBot Flow IDEX XL, one of the largest, smartest, and most expensive 3D printers I've ever reviewed on the channel. This machine has automatic functions for almost everything, and with two independent extruders, a sheet metal chassis, and removable print surface, it has the makings of the perfect 3D printer. But, is it? Hmm, well, let's get started. How's it going guys, Angus here from Maker's Muse. We're here in my garage because, well, this printer is so gigantic that there's literally no chance I would get it into the studio. I know many of you have been waiting patiently for this review, but truthfully, the review process for this 3D printer has been one of the most difficult I've ever done on the channel and has literally taken months of testing. So a thumbs up on the video and a sub to the channel would be really appreciated. It's free and it helps me out hugely. Let's start on the specs. This machine is huge, no doubt about it, but the Flow series come in several flavors. Both iDEX versions have around 425 millimeters and 250 millimeters in Y, depending on the printing configuration, and 250 millimeters in the Z, which is doubled to 500 millimeters in Z for this monster, the iDEX XL. There's also the single extruder variant Flow and the Flow XL, which have slightly different print volumes and lose the iDEX functionality, but overall carried the same interface and features. Construction is incredibly robust, with the chassis being made from sheet metal and heavy duty motion components. I'm not sure why they only went with linear rods for Y when X has far superior linear rails. This is a step back from the previous gen IDEX CraftBot 3, but at least it has rails and a nice big ball screw for that huge cantilevered Z axis. This machine's party trick is the IDEX system with two extruders which move independently on the x-axis linear rail and you can use them in a number of ways such as dual color printing, printing a different support material or more inventive approaches such as mirror or parallel 3D printing or a firm favorite recovery mode. You might be thinking well to do that kind of thing this machine needs some kind of sensors and man does it have sensors. In fact this 3D printer is so jammed full of sensors that it offers the most automatic functionality I've literally ever seen in a 3D printer. Filament monitoring is done using an encoder, something we saw on the CraftBot 3 last year, but it's now integrated into the direct drive all metal hot ends. This means it knows if the filament jams and not just when it runs out, like a basic micro switch sensor would. I'm happy to announce that mesh bed leveling is finally making an appearance on a CraftBot 3D printer, and they've used a genuine BL touch here, along with a complex automatic routine to sample several points across the bed at two discrete printing temps, which is important because this huge aluminum plate will expand enough to disrupt first layer heights between PLA and ABS printing temperatures without compensation. Main bed leveling is done using the traditional three screws and it's manual, yes, but the machine touches off and tells you how much to rotate each nut and when it's dialed in. The last time I saw something similar to this was in the Zortrax line of printers, but I will say the automatic routine, it moves to the point and then waits for you continuously touching off to move the dial, and initially I didn't realize it was waiting for me. There was not really an indication to say, come to the printer, I need attention. So some kind of notification to say, hey, I need your intervention now to level these screws would be handy, because I thought the machine was just gonna do it all on its own, to be honest. Calibrating IDEX is also a user nightmare because you have to align both extruders in X, Y, and Z axes, and to do it manually is incredibly tedious, as I found out during my review of the Copymaster 300 V2. However, instead of guesswork, this machine uses cutouts on the spring steel print bed to locate where the nozzles are, and for leveling the nozzle Z height, it has screws in the side of extruder 2, which you can then loosen and move it up and down. But the design of the shroud makes accessing them seem like a complete afterthought, honestly. It's probably the most unclear part of the cal whole calibration process, despite CraftBot having some quite good tutorial videos. When you first get this machine, there's actually a wizard to step you through all of these calibration steps one by one, and then once you do all of that and you have the machine dialed in, you won't have to do it again unless you move the machine or update its firmware. And during the process of testing, Updating this firmware was something I was doing quite a lot. <laughs> but let's talk about that touchscreen. Since 2015 and my review of the CraftBot Plus, I have loved the responsiveness of CraftBot's interfaces. Everything you need is here, from file navigation to filament management, and a whole array of calibration functions and diagnostic tools. 
It's such a responsive display, it should come as no surprise that the Flow XL and Flow series in, in general runs a complete custom control board with 32-bit architecture. It has internal storage alongside USB storage as well as an IoT integration and a built-in camera. Yes, you can wirelessly control this bad boy over network and watch the print in progress. It's the ultimate lazy maker's tool. First, you have to log into the wireless through your printer's interface and then find that printer's IP and access it from another computer on the same network. From there, you get this interface where you can upload or download G-code and other files. It can even do a time lapse using the webcam if you like. You can start or stop prints, preheat, and then go into the webcam and monitor the prints in real time. While doing long prints through the night, this feature has been amazing. I just would log in and take a look to ensure things are going well and not failed, then I'd just go about my day. I even got the machine hooked up to a cheap IoT mains relay so I can power the whole thing up completely remotely and then start a print. I don't even have to come down here. It's Amazing. I didn't used to care too much about Wi-Fi support because it was often buggy and difficult to implement, but this is definitely one of the more useful implementations I've come across. So then the user experience is clearly superb. The build quality is fantastic. So the printing must be fantastic as well, right? Well, mostly. Here's the thing. Craftbot has shoved so much smarts into this machine that sometimes it comes back to bite them. This is the second Craftbot Flow XL that I've been sent for review. Yeah, because the first was full of issues. Beyond weird firmware and sensor glitches, that machine ended up having two loose motor pulleys with no clear way to access them. And I did offer to repair it, but I, in my correspondence with Craftbot, it turns out by the time I discovered this, the problem had been fixed. They'd changed things. Yeah, haven't heard that one before. After an immense saga and a lot of support from Rick at Fuse3D, who's Craftbot's Australian reseller, this printer finally arrived and I restarted my testing basically from square one. I feel Craftbot tried to rush the initial printer out to beat COVID restrictions, but it didn't really pan out for them with serious QC issues. And unfortunately, I know for a fact that wasn't an isolated case. Judging by their Facebook group, other people have encountered weird issues and Joel telling on his recent unboxing of this machine uh, had a faulty extruder cooling fan on the, the right side out of the box, which could have happened in shipping, who knows, but either way, this is a huge printer. So you can't exactly just send it back to Hungary or some poor reseller to fix. It's not a cheap machine either, so it should arrive working and you shouldn't have to expect to tinker with it out of the box. Either way, I did say I wouldn't base my review conclusions on that machine, but rather this one. So how does this updated 3D printer perform? It's mostly really quite good. Let's start with single material prints. And well, you've been seeing this machine in action for the past few months in almost every project I've done on the channel. The parrot puzzles, custom SD drawer for my desk, headphones holder, and tons more were prototyped and printed on this machine with flawless results and reliability. The ability for me to CAD and then send and observe the print all while staying in the studio has proven incredibly valuable to me. And for single color prints at least, the machine has been very reliable using provided presets in Craftware, which is Craftbot's own slicer. When prints are done, you don't have to hack at the print bed, but instead just remove it and flex the parts off. The printer uses an immense spring steel sheet with PEI and it works perfectly for PLA. For PETG, you need a generous coating of glue stick, but my smallish tests printed fine. From factory, though, this machine is far too open to expect reliable large PETG prints or especially ABS prints. But Craftbot do supply aftermarket covers and a hat to keep the ambient temperature up, which should help quite a bit though I'm not able to test its effectiveness. The machine was able to clear all the way down to 0.15 millimeter gaps on my clearance gauge direct on the PEI, which is incredible. And the surface quality is in general superb. And uh, did I mention how quiet it is? Seriously, like I'm filming right next to it. Considering how loud the old Craftbots used to be, this would be impossible. And this thing is almost like a ghost depending on how fast you print. You could almost work in the same room as this machine, but the curiously aggressive acceleration curves on the movement axes do tend to vibrate the machine quite a lot. And it's this aggressive acceleration that can also induce ghosting or rigging artifacts on prints. So I'll be looking at dialing that back in future. But this machine has two extruders, not one, and they bring several possibilities to the table. Some of them very usable, some of them downright terrible. <laughs> let's, let's start with my favorite parallel printing mode. In this mode, the print bed is roughly halved 
and the second extruder copies exactly the movements of the first, allowing you to effectively print two models in the time it would take to print one. For the stuff I do with my prototyping, this is mega handy, as I can cut down my printing time dramatically on the same machine. There's also mirror mode, which is effectively the same, but it just mirrors the axes. But I don't really see the value of that compared to parallel, other than how visually trippy it is. It's more of a party trick, in my opinion. Another mode worth getting to know is redundancy, which I mentioned earlier in the video, but that reduces your print volume slightly, but turns the second extruder into a spare, ready to jump in and take over should the first extruder fail. If you like, the printer can also send you an alert if something happens, which is pretty handy. And the print bed is so massive that honestly, the chance of something happening, like a filament roll rolling, running out or a jam occurring is quite high. So this feature alone could pay for itself if you intend to make massive prints on this 3D printer. But what about the main use for dual extruders, dual color or dual material printing. Well, like the CraftBot 3 I reviewed last year, getting any kind of decent multicolor prints of this machine has been a huge battle. I've thrown so many test models at this printer using a range of slices and settings, and it's taken a lot of my time. But here's the thing, the issues aren't really the fault of the hardware. Craftware, the slicer made by CraftBot, just isn't good at slicing for dual color. I cannot understand why there's not a good default profile that takes advantage of the IDEX nature of this printer with those wipers. Instead, the default profile makes the machine try to print a cylindrical purge tower at blindingly fast speeds, which is inevitably knocked over and ruins the print. Why? Well, as the extruders are parked, they just ooze and ooze and ooze filament. And this isn't uncommon, all hot ends will do this, but it does mean it takes ages for the extruder to catch up again and start extruding properly. This leads to under extruded parts in the purge tower, which causes it to break in half or under extruded parts in the model or both. There are settings to mitigate this. In your header, you can put G code for tool exit retracts and primes, as well as a pre-change extrusion, which should take advantage of the wipers but I found them all to be buggy and ineffective. So like with the CraftBot 3, it seems most users are resorting to using Simplify 3D for their printing needs, especially dual color, which sucks because you're spending so much on a printer, the supplied software should handle all functions and do it well. I literally have a pile of test models, but here are my best three examples of Floralistics Dual Color Pikachu at 150% scale, sliced with Craftware, Simplify 3D, and a completely custom Prusa slicer profile I put together with the help of a friend. I had to use all sorts of tweaks and tricks and hacks to make them work. Out of all of them, I like the Prusa slicer profile the best, which does a purge correctly, but sometimes the DAGs get pulled over into the print and leave ruined parts, so it's still not perfect. Okay. While I was editing and got a haircut, a new firmware for the CraftBot Flow was made available. And this firmware was supposedly going to fix a lot of the issues I was experiencing with dual color. So I had to go back and test. And look, it has fixed some things. Here's a great example of a slightly larger dual color Pikachu that I did with the default settings in Craftware, and it actually worked incredibly well but there's still under extrusion problems going on. And in another print I tried, the purge tower did in fact break free and ruin the print. And the pre-change extrusion you can set in Craftware doesn't always occur. I'm not exactly sure what's happening there. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It seems to be quite buggy still. So I wanted to be really thorough this video. The latest firmware has allowed me to get some really good dual color prints, but it still has a way to go. Okay, it's pretty clear I'm unhappy with my dual color results across the board, but the single extruder prints are really, really good. When this printer is fed good G-code, it produces great results. Now I know CraftBot has been rolling out constant firmware updates to this printer during testing, so I implore them to do the same for their slicer and their provided slicing profiles. Right, well, I think it's conclusion time. I feel this printer is about 95% there. CraftBot has created one of the smartest 3D printers I've ever reviewed on the channel, but it has not been without its issues. And I know for a fact I'm not alone in suffering these weird, annoying glitches, quality control issues, and what in what is otherwise a fantastic experience. There's just so many sensors in it. Like if, if you get to put the build plate in, it tells you. If there's a collision, it tells you, which is great. But when you add so much stuff, more things can go wrong. and 
things did go wrong, but they are getting better, which is great to see. But I'm not gonna lie, it's so disappointing to be let down by what is essentially software. Craftware hasn't really changed that much from what I can see since 2015 when I did my Slicer shootout, and I really liked it then because it had customizable supports. But the 3D printing landscape has changed so much since then, I just really don't think it's acceptable to rely on also outdated overpriced software like Simplify 3D, which is why I push so hard to get a Prusa Slicer profile working. Um, and I'll leave these, these profiles I've created in the video description, by the way, if you'd like to try them out. But if you don't care about dual color or dual material functionality, then you're probably better off just getting the single extruded flow variants, which are cheaper, because I really have been happy with this performance printing single color models. I do really enjoy parallel printing mode, but the cost jump isn't really justifiable if you only want to use that mode. Because of how tedious this review process has been, I haven't tried swapping nozzles, but it's important to note that with a 0.4 millimeter nozzle that this machine comes with from factory, utilizing the full 500 millimeter Z height could easily take days. And that's why I haven't done giant prints, but I will be swapping to a 0.8 millimeter nozzle for some massive future projects. And I'll let you know how that goes. By the way, these nozzles are proprietary. The whole hot end assembly is their own design, but they're fairly reasonably priced and you can even get hard nozzles if you want to print with abrasives. Speaking of the extruders and nozzles, I know that Joel over at 3D Printing Nerd has also received one of these machines to review, so when his review comes out, he'll have a bit of bit more of an insight into that side of this printer, because there's just so much to cover, so I'll put a link to below and also here to check out his review when it comes out, because it's really important to get different perspectives on machines, especially ones this expensive. Um, because yeah, how expensive is this? Well, are you sitting down? The Craftbot Flow Series starts at 2,600 euro for the single extruder, 3,300 euro or 5,280 Australian dollars plus GST for the IDEX, and 4,000 euro or 6,636 dollars Australian plus GST for this big daddy, the Flow IDEX XL. Yeah, look, it ain't no end of three for sure, but it isn't even in the same league. This printer arrives on a huge pallet, needs two people minimum to move around, and it might just be the machine you're after for your school, college, or design studio, or the ultimate home maker space. I just hope they nail down some better printing profiles ASAP. A big thanks to Craftbot for working with me through this somewhat delayed review, and Rick of Fuse3D, the Australian reseller for Craftbot, who you should definitely hit up if you're after one down under. Links are in the video description. As always, here on Makers Muse, this review has been my own opinion, and it hasn't been paid for, hasn't been given approval. This is the release that you're seeing, and it's the same that Craftbot's going to see as well. I do get to hold onto the machine for future projects though, so I do have some plans because it's so huge. So if you want to check those out, maybe consider subscribing, because here on Makers Muse, my aim to empower your creativity through technology and I look forward to seeing you again very shortly. Thanks for watching guys. Bye.